Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, everyone. Welcome to the Stoa. I am Peter Lindbergh, the steward of the Stoa, and the Stoa is a place for us to cohere and dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of this very moment. And today we have a very special guest, Susan Blackmore. Ooh, I'm, uh, I'm excited uh, for today's session. Um, so I'm going to hand it over to the MC of uh, today's session in a moment, who is Rebecca Fox. Rebecca is an author of a series of graphic novels such as Murmurs of Doubt and How to Be Reasonable. And she has an excellent podcast called The Seeker and the Skeptic. And uh, she's the skeptic, uh, maybe being seduced to being a seeker, we'll, we'll find out. Um, but that being said, I will uh, tag Rebecca in and she will uh, introduce Susan and give the protocols of uh, the Q&A today. So that being said, Rebecca, I'll hand it over to you. Oop, you're, you're, you're in a... Uh, Mute, but it sounds like you're saying something very interesting. Here we go. <laughs> I was just saying, hey, everyone. Um, it's really exciting to be doing this. I'm a big fan of Susan's for many years. As Peter mentioned, I'm a skeptic. So the first time I encountered her work was at a skeptic conference. And um, she got up to speak about, I think it was about, uh, well, it's about lots of things, but out of body experiences. And she talked a little bit about her history. And what really struck me is obviously she's quirky, she's intelligent, she's an amazing speaker, but she's also very, very present in a way that's quite rare sometimes in skeptics. We're also in our head, us skeptics. And it was nice to see someone on stage who was being truly herself, which was very exciting. Uh, so I'm hoping this evening, this afternoon, this morning for some of you uh, to talk about um, the things that we're interested in here at the STOA. And I think Susan will have really insightful things to say about most of this stuff because she's a psychologist, she's a memeticist, and she has had experience believing some very strange things in her past. Um, she studied parapsychology. She knows her way around a lot of esoteric topics. Um, how this is going to work is we're going to have a bit of a chat. I'm going to ask some of the questions I've been saving up for all these, these years as a keen reader of Susan's work, and then I'm going to let you all have a chance to ask your own questions. And we can do that in two different ways. If you'd like to ask Susan directly, then you can write your question, just write question at the top in the chat, and then question about X, whatever your question is about. And I'll call on you to come up on screen and ask that question. Or if you prefer, I can read your question for you. And this is going to be recorded and put on YouTube. So, you know, if you're having a bad hair day or any other reason you don't want to appear on screen, you can just get me to ask questions because my hair's looking amazing today. Uh, so, as I was saying, I'm a long-term fan of Susan's. What I really like about her, what I like about her writing is how she comes at the questions that she asks from at least three different directions. Um, she looks at it as a psychologist and as a scientist. She looks at it as, well, I don't think you'd call yourself a philosopher, Susan, but you look at it in a philosophical way and, well, a thoughtful, critical thinking sort of way, let's say. And then also Only from an- because I never studied uh, philosophy. So I always feel, if, you know, I mustn't call myself, I haven't got a philosophy degree, so I yes. you mustn't call myself a philosopher. Well, well I yeah, do, I agree with you. I kind of think that way. And then also in, in this introspective way, in your actual experience, like you, when, when you're writing a book, for example, um, Zen and the Art of Consciousness, which is all about consciousness, um, you look at the question from the perspective of a practitioner of Zen meditation and from that, that experiential way. So the first question, and I think this is something that we all struggle with just when we're trying to think about the world, is how do you balance those three perspectives? When you're looking at something like consciousness, for example, how do you balance, how do those three things interrelate? I've forgotten what the three are. Uh, <laughs> um, Zen. Um, <laughs> no, the, sci the scientific perspective. Oh, um, the, the philosophical, let, let's say philosophical in inverted commas perspective. And the introspective experiential perspective. Oh, that's easy. Now you've explained. <laughs> um, uh, it's, all, it's all about curiosity. I mean, it, it's all about, I don't understand. What is this? It, it, you obviously have seen... Zen and the Art of Consciousness, which, yeah, it's kind of about consciousness, but it's, it's a book of, it was originally called 10 Zen Questions, and it was me just writing about my experience with 10 koans in Zen, these weird questions. Um, and a lot of them are basically philosophical questions. Who am I? 
what is this? I mean, what is this in Zen is the fundamental question. And I can sit here and think, here's a desk. Um, here's, you know, my hands. Um, there's the trees blowing in the w cold wind. It's the first really cold day of the autumn now. Um, what's that got to do with, with this brain? And anyway, what is it? I mean, what is the universe made of? Physics will tell us it's made of um, atoms and subatomic particles and what have you. Psychologists or, or mystics will say it's all mind. Dualism has to be false, in my opinion, and many people's opinions. But how can this mental and physical be the same thing? They've got to be, but I don't know what it is. So I'll, I'll sit of an evening smoking a joint usually and <laughs> thinking, what is this? How can it be? And sometimes in deep meditation or with psychedelics, uh, particularly in deep meditation, I meditate every day, <clears throat> I've done for decades. I can get to the point where it's obvious. I know that I know why and how monism is true. Um, but then I, you know, come round into a normal state if there's <laughs> such a thing. And I can't make that into a, a scientific theory. But uh, at the risk of rambling on at great length, the answer to your question is they are all really hovering around these deep question about what on earth is being alive, being aware of this immediate experience. And is there a now, or, you know, I mean, how deluded are we? I'm sure we're deluded about consciousness and free will, but are we deluded about time? And you know, I mean, yeah, it's all, it's all part of that. And if that questioning through having weird experiences um, takes me, to a scientific question, well, I'll have a scientific go at it, as I did in several decades of doing parapsychology and looking in vain for paranormal phenomena. Or if it takes me to a philosophical direction, like at the moment I'm arguing deep, deep, long months and months of arguing back and forth with Dan Dennett about free will. <laughs> then, you know, and like he, you know, he knows I'm not a philosopher, but he's, uh, it's wonderful. He keeps, he keeps, he replies the next day or within a few hours, and then it's a week when I, kind of digest this difficult answer and have a go so you know i'm just taken in whichever direction by by where this curiosity takes me i suppose it's interesting um the, it's interesting you bring up weed because one of the things i was wondering is in like in altered states um often in fact i think you said um in one of your talks or possibly elsewhere that when you had your first out-of-body experience you felt like the experience you were having was realer than real and I've been, I've been, and one of the things that concerns me about psychedelics is the possibility of breaking your brain and believing something to be true because some kind of, and obviously I don't really know how brains work very well, but some sort of truth chemical is released in your brain that makes you think things are true that aren't true. Luckily it hasn't happened yet, but it's always like a concern. And I wonder how you, how you think about those moments where things feel true and then what you do with those feelings, like, is that maybe that's what people call gnosis that sort of yeah. feeling of truth yeah and the numinous um yes that feeling that now i know now yeah. it's right so i i don't know about frying your brain or whatever you called it um <laughs> i would say it's not a particular chemical it's a particular part of the brain that's um that's giving the sense of, of rightness and that's going to be active and so on of course, there are some people, <clears throat> actually many, that's why you and I are skeptics, I guess, who will take some experience like that. It might be a dramatic psychedelic experience. It might be a very ordinary experience, like reading some rubbish, fake news, um, conspiracy theory thing and going, yes, that fits with everything I've always thought. So it's obviously true. And I'm going to, you know, tell everybody about it. Um, but that's not my approach, obviously. So <clears throat> in that out of body experience and it's 50 years ago now, so <laughs> I mean, I can still remember it because it's so vivid, but I, you know, I can't rely on my memory re really. But I, I would say that my response to that was to be completely convinced by the way it felt. People having NDEs and OBEs, not so much ordinary OBEs, some of them and some not, but NDEs typically it's realer than real. And this may well be because, at least this is an idea that um, an ayahuasca. Um, a man I know who, who, who's an expert, ayahuasca, um, he wouldn't call himself a shaman, but he, he is really. But he's pointed out that um, in, in the, many of those states, you've got no sensory input, which we know is important for having out-of-body and near-death experiences, but 
all you've got to go on is the stuff coming in imagination and it's going to seem real because there's nothing else saying it isn't real it's a very obvious point really but it took yeah that out to me so it's not surprising this this realness but that's slightly different from the numinous the 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 the, the, the knowing um feeling my response in 50 years ago was to say well now i know i'm superior <laughs> <laughs> I know that there's more in your philosophy than all that stuff, you know. Um, and I know that there's another world because I've been there. And I know there's an astral body because I have seen it and felt it and flown around with it. And so I know. So I am going to prove to the world, particularly to my physiology and psychology lecturers at Oxford who are very, you know, closed minded materialists. And I'm going to prove to them that they're all wrong. <laughs> and of course, this is not a very scientific attitude, but somehow being me whatever that means i i was really persistent and i just went on and on and on looking for paranormal phenomena and never finding them and then changing my whole question that's really the key to being a scientist i don't know about a philosopher probably the same you ask some question and if you get an answer great if you find that it's the wrong question that's is as helpful in another way because it's the questions that you ask that are important so i began asking well why and how do people have realer than real feeling out of body experiences if it's not proof of, of a, another world and life after death and ghosts and poltergeists and telepathy and all the things I thought it was. And that's, that's where it took me. And that's already from the beginning, a combination of a scientific approach and respecting the actual experiences that you've had. And when something feels that sense of absolute knowledge, well, hold it. It might be absolute knowledge and absolutely right and really helpful, or it might be just, you know, just your brain telling you, telling you wrong. That's the world <laughs> we live in. That's our kind of way our minds are. So yeah, let's go for it and, and explore. So you used the word um, monist, monist earlier, and I kind of like I've got these three M words: uh, materialist, monist, and mystic, floating in my around in my head when I think of you. Do, like is one of those sort of something you write on a name label and where about or, that is such, or all that three is such, that is such a pertinent question this week <laughs> um i don't know if you know john horgan he was famous for um writing a book called the end of science he, he write he does a podcast for scientific american and, and um column and stuff for scientific american and he interviewed me a couple of weeks ago and wrote this whole um, no, it's not a podcast. Sorry, it's a blog. blog. Wrote his Scientific American blog post about me, and we talked about these kinds of things in a way. Um, and then he sent me and said, "Here's the link." I checked all the text and everything, and then he sent me the link, and it said at the top how to be a mystical monist, uh, a mystical <laughs> materialist, right? And I went, "What?" And you know, as much as you can in email, and. Um, immediately you know how could you say this and i looked through the what i what he put of what i said and the two places in that interview i've said materialism fails it can't account for consciousness uh, at least not consciousness in the way most people think of it um idealism fails for the opposite reason um i'm not a materialist i keep telling everybody i'm not a materialist <laughs> sorry i shouldn't shout um <laughs> And so very kindly, because I'd reacted very quickly and he had time to do it, it was changed to how to be a mystical skeptic. Mm. So you can see this little you know, debate between us was very pertinent to this moment. <laughs> it's obviously a psychic phenomenon that you asked that question. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, I think monist is people don't, people on, a lot of people know what dual, dualist is, but they don't kind of notice the opposite, which is monist. And I just call myself a neutral monist. And if I look that up online, I get completely freaked out by all the clever and difficult things it means. Um, and I'm not a philosopher, so I feel all embarrassed and I don't know what it means. <laughs> uh, so I just mean, all I mean is I, I'm damn sure there's only one kind of stuff here, but I don't know what it is. And okay, that is the I like question it. I'm yeah. asking all the time. What is it? <sighs> <laughs> when, you, when you say materialism fails to explain consciousness, like what's, what's the key failure that you see there? Well, if by consciousness you mean subjective experience that is an experience that I am having and is private and nobody else can get into it and it is um, uh, different from 
the physical world that we know from all the experiments and, and physics and chemistry and everything, then you've got, a, you, you get very quickly into dualism. And um, I was for a long time, I mean, or yeah, have been a, a great fan of Dan Dennett because he demolishes, you know, he's, his, his version of illusionism, it's different from mine in consciousness, but all the ways in which we get it wrong. And um, we get it wrong right from the start, really. I feel that um, if you take that view on consciousness, then, then you're inevitably dragged into dualism and that won't work. So what do you do? To me, the only way to, 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 to square any kind of materialism with the existence of this experience is um, by exploring how and why we're deluded about its nature. So I would say, even I mentioned Dan Dennett because he, he has this idea about Cartesian materialism. That is the idea that most um, philosophers and scientists will say, no, I'm not a Cartesian dualist. I've given up, you know, substance dualism and what have you. Um, and yet they still write and talk as though there's an audience in the Cartesian theater, this mythical place inside our heads where I am, you know, and so if I am, as he would put it, a benign user illusion, as I would put it, a malign user illusion, that's the problem that, <laughs> brings us to suffering and so on, um, then, you know, what of consciousness? The, the sense of the, the, the idea that so many scientists in, in the world of consciousness studies say, well, you can't have experience without an experiencer. And I go, you can. You know, it's, it's not how it normally is, but you can. Deep meditation, psychedelics, there's stuff happening, but there's no one it's happening to. You know, this is described by, by many people and myself um so um to come back to your question about why materialism fails it either takes you into dualism like that or it puts you straight into the problems of physics and you know well what what does materialism mean anyway what is it all made of you know and anyway we we only know the physics by doing experiments which we have experience of reading off the numbers on the dials and well, you can see I'm getting into I'll shut up because I'm getting myself into the sort of trouble that I like, but I can't say anything coherent about. <laughs> well, let me move you into an even more um, troublesome area. Uh, let's talk about... Uh -oh. um, <laughs> Let's talk about, you know, esoteric stuff. Um, so there's a couple of things which, uh, like from, you know, my layperson's understanding, seem to be sort of groping at a conception of how culture works, or what we might call mimetics, but in a weird way. So there's like Jungian archetypes. And I don't know if you're familiar with chaos magic at all, but they, they're sort of looking at, it's basically the idea that there is... Um, what Alan Moore calls uh, like an idea world or idea realm and mm. they think that they can intervene in it so they basically think they can control the way that ideas flow around it by doing all sorts of rituals and is interesting that's like things. platonic sort of idea it's kind of not? platonic yeah it's kind of inspired by that but I'm sure you're familiar with Jungian archetypes so uh, do you think there are connections between mimetics and that sort of thing are these like the alchemy that, that will become the science or are they completely divorced and i'm barking up the wrong tree or what do you think i'm just smiling because i did a really weird and stressful interview with jordan peterson oh, yeah. and he said somebody's nodding um he said uh, mimetics is rubbish it's all just jungian archetypes <laughs> and i no, it isn't <laughs> uh, but it was so it was so slippery to argue with that you know we never got anywhere with that but um you can watch that online it's on my website if anyone's interested because he's quite a, a, a strong interesting character um so uh i i don't really think those kind of ideas make sense um mm. i would say rather that human brains are pretty much similar the world over of course every brain is sculpted differently by upbringing by the memes that you um are forced on you when you're young and then that you select as you get older and become more able to select the memes that you want to keep and the ones you want to pass on and so on. Um, but it's not like that. It's not like the, the memes themselves. Hang on. I must say for anyone who's not aware of the, what I mean by the word meme, I'm using its original sense from Dawkins, that which is imitated or that which is copied. So if somebody copies an idea of painting in this way or an idea of a joke or, a, you know, it's the, it's the idea or the behavior or whatever is copied is what I call the meme. Don't worry about 
where it is in the brain or any other complications, just, just that. So um, you could see how you'd get to the idea that, well, they're all kind of out there already, and but why? And, and, and what would they, where would they be? What would be the, the, the medium in which they're carried? I mean, information has to have a, ha, have a, a, a physical basis to, to, to be information. It can't just go float, as far as I know, can't just go floating about, you know, <laughs> you catch it. So uh, th th these similarities, and that would apply to the archetypes, which in one reading of Jung, um, they're sort of out there and weird and their psychic synchronicity and all of that. In another reading of it, it's just how we evolved and no wonder we're similar. And we come up with these architects again, because of our similar brains. Um, so, and the same I would say about having out of body experiences and so on, it doesn't prove there's an astral body that goes somewhere else. It shows that everyone around the world is capable of, of having this dislocation of body schema. Um, and it's our similar brains that do it. So no, I, 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 I don't go in the direction of, of those ideas. No, that, that makes sense to me too. I, I think, um, like I said, perhaps, perhaps some of these things are trying to, to look for explanations and using like more metaphorical thinking as they try to explore it and come up with some strange conclusions, but interesting conclusions. <laughs> Yeah, um, well, it's good to have a lot of ideas to choose from when you're exactly. having things. <laughs> yeah. Um, so the other thing that I, I mentioned that I wanted to ask you about was this idea um, that a lot of people have been talking about around here in the Stoa, um, that we are, as you know, the sea of faith recedes and we become a less religious culture worldwide. And I don't even know if that's true, to be honest. I don't have stats to hand, but it's, you know, generally accepted that religion's on the wane. It's um, true in most Western countries and certainly in Europe, but it's, it's dodgy elsewhere. That's anyway, exactly what popped into my head as I was saying that. I was like, oh, be yeah. careful, fact check myself. But anyway, so this idea that without the religious sort of structures that we used to have um, that gave us meaning, um, whatever that means, that people are feeling a deficit and that's coming across in, you know, this longing for the interest in meditation, interest in philosophy, and on the bad side, you know, like nihilism and what people, some people have called a mental health crisis. Again, don't have statistics, but it's an interesting observation. I just wondered as someone who's an atheist, but who obviously is concerned about these big questions, what you make of that. Do you think that to talk about the idea of a meaning crisis even makes sense? And what would you suggest would be solutions if you do? I suspect that it's not, I don't know what you mean by meaning exactly, but I suspect it's not so much meaning as purpose. Mm. It's the feeling of purposelessness that gets people down. And Christianity um, gives you a purpose um, because, you know, obeying God's will, so does Islam, um, obeying Allah and only doing things that Allah wishes and so on, gives you a purpose uh, and a structure. And we humans need structure, however ghastly the structure. I mean, it horrifies me. I consider the major religions to be really pernicious meme plexes. If you look at the history of any of them, you find, you know, it's like a, an evolutionary bush of, of different sects and so on. And you ask the mimetic question. The question coming from a memes perspective, memes are evolving and competing to use our brains to get copied. Coming from that perspective, why has Islam ended up this way? Most of it with the, you know, the Shia and the Sunnis and the different bits that there are, and Christianity and these multiple versions, but loads more died out. That's a kind of evolutionary perspective. Well, the ones that stay, one of the big reasons is basic biology. You know, um, the, the basic thing about sperm and eggs, um, the best biological strategy for women is to protect their... Um, that the few children they can have choose the best mate they can and, and look, look after them best they can. Uh, the best strategy for men is to fuck everything in sight and it doesn't matter because you can have as many children and let the women look after them. And what do we find in these religions? What we find is women trapped, you know, the, from, sorry, from the man's point of view, yeah, but, but if, you're going to, if, you, if you're a man, you're going to put any investment into a woman and, and those children, then you've got to make sure that they're your children and not somebody else's. Hence, veils and body coverings and all the um, admonitions against sex and all of that kind of thing those kinds of things it's, it's just basic biology meaning that these memes thr thrive better than nicer memes is from a woman's point of view um so we have all these religions around 
Um, take Buddhism, which I, I mean, although I've been training in Zen for ooh, 40 years nearly, um, I'm not a Buddhist. I don't want to sign up to any beliefs. Obviously, I wouldn't, <laughs> would I? Um, but the training is amazing. But a fascinating phenomenon that I think has happened in Buddhism, and I'd like to explore more, is what the Buddha said mostly is about the self is an illusion. Everything is ephemeral and ever-changing. Um, as well. It is impermanent. It has all the marks of existence, um, impermanent suffering. Um, it can lead to nihilism, and that is one of the problems. I mean, you mentioned nihilism. It can lead you to, oh, if I don't exist, what's the point in anything? <laughs> or it can lead you to deep insight into thisness and how it is and being able to behave and watch thoughts come and go and self come and go and so on. But what's happened in Buddhism is, is, a, is a harping back to all the ideas of reincarnation, which were around in some of the countries where Buddhism went in the early time, because reincarnation gives you that purpose. If you're really yeah. good in this life and you do lots of meditation and so on, then ah, you will get to a higher bit. You'll be next, next life will be as a higher being. And if you're really bad and wicked, you'll come back as, I don't know, whatever, and low, in the low hells. And then all these hells and things, which don't, to me, make any sense whatsoever. That's why I like Zen, because it's more free of those things than, uh, than other um, kinds of, um, of Buddhism. So we see the mimetic processes here, turning, giving people purposes in life that then cause them to take on absolutely untrue rubbish ideas like there's a heaven and a hell and there's a god who cares about you and all of that kind kind of stuff now i've completely lost the plot what your question was <laughs> no <laughs> so i think you, you you give them, it's interesting because this is kind of what you do um when when talking about consciousness as well in that you um you say the questions that we're asking are the wrong questions um like we can't find consciousness because it, mm. it's not there to find and i feel like you're saying a similar thing about meaning there's a lot of talk about realizing meaning whether that means um people think the meaning's out there in the world in in a religion or in a, a transcendent deity or whatever and that they're going to realize it and find out it's true or realizing it as in making it real like kind of an existentialist yeah. thing of making it real um and what i what i got from what you were saying or what i feel like was underneath what you were saying is perhaps the answer is to live with the reality that there is no meaning and find a way to be in that instead of yeah. searching for it or trying to invent it. Yes, I think that's right. I think the, can't think of the right adjective, way to live, <laughs> <laughs> fill in blank space, um, is to accept that all meanings and purposes are created by us and by our culture and by our memes and find a way in life to go with those meanings and those purposes without thinking that there's anything ultimate about them or anything that will lead to something beyond the life that you're living with these temporarily held meanings and purposes. Yeah, that's great. I got some, I got some self-help advice as well from you. <laughs> <laughs> So I suppose it's time for me to stop being so selfish and share, share Susan with all of you. Um, if people have put questions in the chat, but I, they haven't put whether they would like to speak or whether they would like me to speak on their behalf. So um, that, would, that would be useful if you could just say, um, this is a question I'd like to ask or whether it's a question that I'd like to ask on your behalf. So usually um, if they don't indicate anything, that means they're uh, happy to ask it themselves. Oh, okay, cool. Well, in that case, uh, can we um, call on Tom, Tom Beekbane? Uh, if you're ready to ask your question, that'd be great. Sure. Hi, Susan. I'm Tom Beekbane from Toronto. Uh, since you wrote The Meme Machine, um, <clears throat> do you think there's been progress towards unifying uh, different viewpoints, you know, the, the materialistic viewpoint and, and the mystical viewpoint? Uh, are you becoming less skeptical or, or um, more skeptical about um, science's ability to sort of explain <clears throat> the, the soft side of life, if you like? Oh, I'm, I'm endlessly optimistic about the ability of science because science is not 
is not a fixed thing that you can pin down. It's more of an attitude and approach. So whatever problem or question there is, we may not be able to do the science on it right now, but in principle, I, this is a dodgy one, isn't it? But in principle, I don't see that there's anything that science can't actually uh, get a handle on. I'm not sure why, why you relate this to the meme machine, because I thought maybe you were going in the direction of, has there been any progress in memetics, which has been extremely little, and then lots of interesting reasons, possible reasons why. Um, but I don't think there's any reason to think that science can't have a go at it. It's just that we haven't found the right way. I, I could draw an analogy, it's only an analogy, with, with Darwin and, and um, the recognition of evolution by natural selection that just hung on in there. I mean, people at the time saw some of the potential, were horrified, a lot of them were horrified. Um, some thought it was wonderful, but in the absence of the science to be able to discover genetics, um, it couldn't get very far without knowing, without knowing how the, the copy, you need for an evolutionary process, copying, varying, and selecting. You need those three to make up the evolutionary algorithm. And although Darwin could see that, he didn't know about the term algorithm, but he, that's basically what he was saying, that if you keep doing that again and again and again, you must get evolution. But without knowing how the copying was done, um, you know how the selection was done, natural selection, because things die if there's not enough food and there's predators and there's not enough water and air, you know, naturally, natural selection does the job. But he couldn't understand uh, the the nature of the copying of the information down the generations or the where the variation came from and without that you couldn't really get anywhere until the early 20th century when it became scientifically um, available through the kind of um, biology chemistry and so on that we had and i think it's the same with mimetics um we we're, we're floundering around i i still think i mean i read i read the meme machine again recently because it's 20 years and i thought oh God, <laughs> what did I write? Um, and I think I would still agree with most of it, certainly the, the basic argument, but I think we're not in a position at the moment to, um, to write, to ask the sort of questions that give us a scientific handle on it, but I think we might be getting there. I hope so. And I certainly don't think there's any reason why we shouldn't. Does that answer your question? Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. <laughs> Great. Um, Peter, would you like to ask your question? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned this on your uh, answer to the, the last question. Um, so was, uh, I was curious what your sense of how the field of memetics has progressed and you said very little. So maybe why is that the case, you think? And then the other part of the question is what is the best criticism of the concept or the field you have heard or any criticism that's given you pause? I, I, I think there are lots of reasons why. I think basically it hasn't got anywhere. What, what has happened since in, in those 20 years? I mean, the, the, the meme idea goes back to 1976 with Dawkins' selfish gene. Um, but if you start from the meme machine, um, basically most scientists think the idea is rubbish. Remember that 20 years ago, there was no such thing as an internet meme. So most people now only know the term meme through the existence of internet memes which made Richard pretty pissed off to begin with, <laughs> and me in a way, but I more than he argued that actually they're a very good example. If you, if you know what an internet meme is, then you can easily grasp the idea that memes are information that's copied, buried, and selected, and there's huge selection pressure. So the very few beautiful pussycats that get on, you know, get millions of views, and the not so attractive pussycats that, or worse jokes that don't. So I think they're not a bad example. So that's been very good in the sense that the, the term meme has come to be much better known. Um, but what has happened simultaneously is a real flourishing of cultural evolution theory and, and, and uh, empirical research. So I have been to some conferences um, and met with people who are studying, for example, the in in Inuit by Inuits and the way that's passed on and the selection is when they sink you know <laughs> um I'm use that as a very sort of simple idea of, of memes meme selection um but they they study uh, apprenticeships and and groups of uh, different different societies it's a lot of it is anthropology and the basic difference I would say between and it's very successful there's a lot of work going on really discovering a lot about human behavior in many different cultures. Um, 
Now, the real difference between that and memetics is absolutely fundamental. In the end, those people go back to genetic advantage as the driving force. So the reason why the cultures evolved the way they do and the behaviors evolved the way they did is because of the way the genes have made us and that it ultimately benefits the genes. This goes back to um, E.O. Wilson's, the uh, famous uh, saying that um, the genes will always keep culture on a leash. Now, there are many of these people will say, well, obviously the leash is getting longer and longer. We live now, everything changes so fast that genes haven't got time to kill off those of us who believe the wrong idea. I mean, you know, it's all happening too fast. Um, but the mimetic idea, of course, is, is quite different. It is that memes are a second replicator. This planet has genes first, memes second, a new way of copying information using brains, not using DNA and chemistry. Um, and that just as genes are selfish, so memes are selfish. And that culture is evolving for the benefit of the memes. Now, why hasn't this gone anywhere? Well, I would just like to mention one recent study, which is absolutely fascinating. Um, a study of um, the witch trials and, you know, burning witches at the stake and all those horrible things. Um, a study which showed um, that this is not really science, it's more um, history, but it showed that if, it, if, if, the, um, if you analyze um, the effects of these witch trials, were they of benefit to the people who were burnt? No. Were they of benefit to the people doing the burning? No. I mean, there's a deep analysis in this paper. Um, uh, is it of benefit to the society as whole, as whole which it happened? Is it of benefit to any small groups within that society? And all the answers came back to be no. And that, I think, is an example of the way we need to go in memetics to find something where we can show that it benefited those memes without benefiting us, the meme machines. That's the way I'd love it to go. If you want to know more about why it doesn't, partly I've, I've said because it's difficult to find ways to do that, but I'm sure we're beginning to do it and I'm sure we will. But people also just don't get the idea. I think the main reason is people don't get it and they partly don't get it because they don't like it, um, but they partly don't get it because the same problem that Darwin had it and they say oh, oh do you know my MP is a creationist oh. um but sorry this is kind of I can you believe it 21st century my MP in the is UK. a creationist anyway yeah here in South Devon yes he's, he re represents me in parliament he's very nice and charming and always answers my objection emails I write him but anyway <laughs> now where was I um so uh, I, I was thinking, I'm thinking of the Ameri Americans, more than 50% um, of Americans don't believe in evolution. <sighs> the reason I think the fundamental reason is the way we naturally think is that a design requires glasses here had to have a designer. Uh, this phone had to have a designer, uh, this cup, had to have a designer and that's kind of true in a sense there were humans involved in this and they had the ideas and then you know so the idea of design without a designer is counterintuitive and that was absolutely what Dawkins was on about and what Dennett was on about but it's counterintuitive and I think that is one reason why people don't like memetics and another reason is they don't like applying evolutionary theory at all so sociologists and so on don't like um, the, the sort of biological implications of evolutionary theory coming in. The biologists don't like people like me. Because, well, I don't know. Anyway, they, they don't like the idea of, of, of um, evolutionary theory being kind of subverted to metics when that's kind of weird and that's their realm and shouldn't be taken away. Many, many reasons why it's difficult. I think memetics will only thrive when and if it proves possible to carry on that kind of idea of experiments in which you find out is this to the benefit of the genes? Is it to the benefit of the humans? Is it to the benefit of groups? Or is it actually just only to the benefit of the memes? That would make memetics different from standard cultural evolution theory and very, very much worth doing. 
Wow, good question. Um, we've got another one from someone with a very appropriate um, handle. Uh, would Mimetic Caper like to ask their question? Or would you like me to ask it for you? No, I, I can ask it. Great. Um, hi, Susan. So um, Hello. here's my question. A Cartesian dualism destroys purpose by making the objective world void of it and the subjective world undefinable. But if purpose or desire is mimetic, is there a way to bridge the Cartesian gap through the scientific study of memes as a means of re-emerging the world in meaning? You're going to have to repeat that slowly because I don't, I didn't understand the first bit. So just say that again. So the first bit, I'm, I'm making the claim that a Cartesian dualism um, voids uh, people's worldview of meaning because um, the objective world is just clockwork. It's just happening automatically. There's no uh, purpose to it. It's just, it's random or... Uh, I, I, I'm with you. In the subjective world, we can't say anything about because it's, it's not observable. That's very interesting. I mean, I didn't understand it because I, I don't agree at all, but I be, I'm, now you've said it again, I can see what you're getting at. But I, I really don't see why Cartesian dualism should do that. Because, I mean, after all, Cartesian dualism gives we humans, and not the rest of the living world, a soul or a spirit, which answers to God. And therefore, there's huge purpose. I mean, the purpose of a true Cartesian dualist, as in Descartes' time, certainly, but probably still to some extent to this day. It, and that's, I think, why it's so popular. I mean, basically, some form of dualism is the natural way we think. We know from developmental psychology that kids from a very young age, uh, and I've got two little granddaughters, age two and five, and I can see these things emerging as the sense of self emerges. Um, so comes the sense of, uh, and, the, and also the discrimination between living and non-living things, self moving and things that have to be pushed. These things all lay the ground for a kind of dualism in which there are minds that do things and design things and have ideas. And there are physical things out there that, don't, that we manipulate. It's the world that's given to us um, to manipulate. And so I think to, to my mind, that kind of dualism gives people um, basic meaning and purpose in life. Their purpose is to be a good soul and, and to exploit the world the best they can. Um, rather than taking it away. I can imagine from what you've said that for some people it would take away meaning and purpose, but I think for the majority it doesn't. So what's the second part of your question? Well, I, I guess I could have said uh, you could replace Cartesian dualism in my question with uh, scientific materialism. I'm, I, I'm, yeah, I know it's Yes, off oh, with, much. Uh, yeah, absolutely straight on there. That will take you in a certain interpretation. Okay. That will take you straight into it. Yes. Yeah, so go on. Yeah, so the second part of the question is that uh, if purpose or desire or meaning, whatever you want to call it, uh, if it's mimetic, um, is there a way to bridge the, the Cartesian gap uh, through the scientific study of memes as a way of re-emerging the world in meaning? Like, can, um, because there's purpose in the memes, I guess is what I'm saying, um, studying the meme scientifically, it brings purpose back to the world. That's... I am not at all sure about that because there's so little of real scientific study of memes. But I want to, to, to think about your suggestion that, that purpose and meaning in life are mimetic. So the specific purposes that we have, for example, I get up in the morning and get to my desk and there's a bloody email and I can't bear it and I have to spend however much time it is um, trying to deal with it. And that's a kind of a purpose. That's a memetic purpose because that's all memes, all that information being sent uh, um, to me. Um, I can have other purposes, for example, like to be as mindful as my training allows me to be. And that's a way of living from just going along, responding thoughtlessly to, to, to everything. And so, and that's a meme that I have been taught um, over the decades, how to, um, in Zen terms, sit down, shut up and see what the mind does. Um, so those are memes, but fundamentally, we go back to genes. And this is so often the case. There are pure memetic things we can do. People studying stuff on the internet. There's lots and lots of that. There's lots of fantastic studies of, um, of memetics. Um, in the digital world, which I think is a somewhat 
different issue. But when it comes to memes um, shared with humans, it, the need for purpose, the need for meaning is a biological drive, I would say. We, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't be here as a species if we didn't have genes that inclined us to seek out purposes and, and follow them up. And they start obviously with getting food, getting mates, having fun, um, learning stuff that might be useful to us. I mean, that genetic endowment has given us the basis from which all of these, this yearning for purpose and meaning comes. The memes just come in and give answers to some extent. So I would never say that purpose and meaning is purely mimetic. Would I never say that? Well, I don't at the moment anyway. So I just, I just want to add on the one last part of my question. That's a, it's a separate question. Um, are you familiar with Rene Girard? No, I'm afraid not. So I'm going to strongly recommend that um, you do at least some investigation into this guy because he's a, he's a, I guess he's a literary theorist uh, or anthropologist. I'm not, maybe a bit of both. Um, but his whole theory is based on uh, imitated desire. Um, and he actually calls it mimetic desire, but it's like the Latin word mimetic. It's basically the same meaning. Um, and you know, I think no, hang on, mimetic maybe, and mimetic, uh, mimetic and mimetic are not the same. But anyway, go on. Oh, uh, okay. Well, um, yeah, he probably exaggerates the degree to which all purpose is imitated or all desire. Like he, he, um, I, I definitely think there's something to the biological. Uh, causation of desire, right? But um, Gerard doesn't focus on that because he's, it's not really in his uh, domain. But he, he's a very interesting theorist. Um, he, I've written down the name. Yeah. He, yeah. I, I second that recommendation for René Gerard. I've read a lot. It's interesting, especially as an atheist, to read him because I believe he's a Christian and comes from that perspective. But uh, yeah, it's definitely worth a read. So um, maybe Evan could go next if you're ready to ask your question. Well, I'd just say something about that. I think that's not incompatible with what I was saying, that you start with a biological um, foundation of wanting desires and um, of wanting, um, yeah, desires and purpose and, and, and all of that. And the memes build on that. They wouldn't be doing what they're doing if it weren't for that biologic underpinning. But studying the way they're then um, Im Im imitated and, and copied is... I guess I will have a look and read this stuff. <laughs> um, Evan, if you want to step forward, um, sure. so hi. to speak. Um, <laughs> hi, Hello. this is Evan. Thank, thank you for coming mm -hmm. here. I've uh, followed and loved your work for a long time. I was had a question. I'm assuming in this question that you're familiar with uh, Thomas Metzinger's ideas, um, like as presented to being no one, for example. I was curious just if you had any commentary on that or because to me that seems like an extremely satisfying theory, his whole phenomenal self model theory about uh, the nature of selves and how, you know, a sort of uh, materialist compatible theory for how selves get constructed. I was wondering if you had any thoughts or comments on that. Before I try and answer that, let me tell you a story. Um, I had this very dramatic out of body experience in 1970. In 1985, my husband got a job in Germany. And now this is pre-internet, pre-mobile phones, everything letters and so on and so on. I got a letter from this young man, we were both young in 1985, called Thomas Metzinger, saying, because he'd read my book on out-of-body experiences, which is a very skeptical book in 1982. And he wrote and he said, um, uh, you are wrong. I've had an out-of-body experience and I know. We're going back to Rebecca, your question about knowing. <laughs> he knew that there's life after death and an astral world and all that stuff. And he wanted to prove to me that I was wrong. And I said, well, actually, I'm, I'm now living in Germany. And so he came to visit me in Tübingen. And we just got on like a house on fire. And that's a funny <laughs> expression, isn't it? Uh, I don't know. I don't know if it's just an English expression. We got on very well and we've been friends ever since. I don't see him very often, but um, he's in Germany and I'm here. Um, but uh, I, I've known him very well. So I was very, very interested in that, that book about self. It's very good. To answer your question properly, I would need to read it again. Um, I think the, uh, the, the, the whole self model thing it's going back that long. Even in 1986, I gave a conference paper in which I said that 
Um, there's nothing it's like to be a human being, the whole thing. There's only something it's like to be the model, the representation. And in a way, that's what he's saying. But his way of saying it is slightly different from mine. But the reason that I stopped doing that after 1986 is because I simply couldn't get a handle on what's meant by a model or a representation. And I looked into the philosophy a little bit. Again, no internet, um, you know, have to go to the university library and go to philosophy books and find, you know, it's really, really hard to find things out in those days. Um, and um, I gave up on it because I really couldn't at all make a theory out of what's meant by a model. Now, I'm not saying that his theory falls because of that same problem, but it's still lurking there. This self model and its um, implications for subjectivity, it, what exactly is the model? Do we need to know inside the brain what the model is doing? This also relates to um, uh, meditation practice. Um, like myself, Thomas is a long-term lifelong and we have shared many discussions about that as well. Um, so uh, I, I'm, I'm very much in tune with, with Thomas's views, but I wouldn't go, oh, he's absolutely right, because I don't think we've, we've got to the bottom of what it means to be a phenomenal self-model. And I think we may do so, and that will throw much more light on both his views and mine and Dennett's and various other people who talk about these models. It, there's a, a little connection here with the out-of-body experience stuff, because I did a book a couple of years ago called Seeing Myself, in which I really pulled together what happened to me in that original experience all that time ago, which led me to think I was going to prove the existence of, you know, all that stuff. Um, which is that we now know that the, the temporoparietal junction here um, is a kind of hub for controlling the body schema, which is a model or representation of the body that you need all the time to be able to move and speak and everything else. And that out of body experiences happen when that's disturbed, that that model of self is then connected up in different parts of the brain with a self image. Who am I? What am I like? What do people think of me? What do I think of myself? And to the control areas and frontal cortex and so on. Um, now, knowing that kind of stuff, um, maybe we can it, it, the body schema is a, is a really easy, it, it, philosophically, I guess, easy idea of a model. It literally represents the position of the body in a three-dimensional space. But a model, a phenomenal self-model is something slight, somewhat more than that. And I would love to know the connections. So yes, uh, I'm absolutely, um, I love Thomas's ideas, but there's, I think there's a long way to go. Great. These are all such great questions. I'm glad I passed mm. it over to the chat. <laughs> um, so maybe we can squeeze in just one more. Uh, we've um, Adam has got a, po a popular question that people seem to want him to step forward and ask. If you'd like to come forward, Adam. Hi. Um, I was just wondering about the moral status of the con potential conflict between genes and memes. Because like, if you have both replicators going, it you know, I, I could almost imagine a future in the meme wars where some humans are fighting on behalf of the memes, and other mm -hmm. humans are want the genes to control what happens. I mean, it, it, it just, it makes me wonder if, if we're stuck as atheists in a kind of morally neutral landscape there of like, well, there's genes and memes and like, those both seem like meaningful processes, but like, is there, is it just sort of a, a wash? Like, are they just, you know, two political parties or, you know? Oh, that's so depressing. Why do we have to have such a depressing <laughs> question? Because where, where you're taking me, <clears throat> excuse me, where you're taking me, of course, is, is, is what you're hinting at there. You kind of, you, you ask the question as though, will it end up like that? It's there already. People defend the memes they have, and I would love to understand more why that is. I mean, you can glibly say, well, cognitive dissonance, once you've believed something, you don't want the dissonance of then discovering it's wrong, and of course, we're back to what it means to be a scientist or a philosopher who changes your mind when the evidence makes you change it and so on. Um, but <clears throat> religions, going back to them, and you were talking about atheism, are a prime example of, uh, me of memeplexes that cause their bearers to pass them on. And therefore, all those American Christians, well, and all, all, those, all the Muslims around the world, are all, lots of them, the ones who are deeply infected with it. Um, they 
are willing to spend a huge proportion of their time and energy um, and brain power to force those ideas on other people. Why? Why? And we're back then to my question about which religions or which religious um, uh, versions have thrived. Take, um, spread the good news of Jesus. Now, biologically, we are a, a social species. We use reciprocal altruism. Um, you know, I do something for you, you pay me back. We keep tracks on who's good and who's not. So from that point of view, we all want to be good, or at least we want to be perceived to be good. And I call this the goodness trick or the altruism trick. So these religions play a trick. It's, it's evolved through other religions dying out. The ones, to some extent, the ones left, certainly in those major religions, are the ones that, that tell you you are a good person if you pass on these ideas. So um, in Islam, there's a kind of conflict because in some places in the Quran, it says you must never force it on anyone. But then in other places, it's telling you how important it is that everybody else joins you and otherwise you're going to kill them or, or, or um, various other horrible punishments for them. Um, so that's a good example of how um, people come to want to promote their ideas. I mean, two examples, a simple one, just the kind of cognitive dissonance. I've had this great idea, so I want other people to agree with me because then I look clever and good. Um, so I'm good in that way. Or the kind of moral one, which I think you were getting at more, that, that religions give you um, a rule about what counts as moral and what counts as not moral. So I'm sure all of you, whichever of you out there um, are atheists, will have thought about this because constantly we're being told um, that, that people, many religious people feel that you can't have more, you can't have good morals without believing in God because they all come from God. And this is very pernicious, but it's part of the way those religions have succeeded is to persuade the believers that that's how it is, that they wouldn't be good if they didn't follow these rules. And then the rules, of course, we're back again in something else you said reminded me. We're back again into that biological thing, the big sex difference thing, which is obviously particularly irksome to me as a female, um, is, is, is um, it's very often the women, it's the women who actually carry out the FGM. It's the women who persuade other women that abortion is a bad idea. And oh, the American situation with the, uh, the woman who's just died, uh, and we might get an anti-abortion um, lawyer chosen by Trump. The, these are examples. It really, that's to me a really horrible example to think that women will, will um, stand up for those biologically based ideas that every life is precious, that it's got a soul given by God, that even a, even a few cells in a, in a, um, have, have been beginning to be an embryo um, have more uh, importance than a mother's life or indeed the child's life that might be horrendous if the child wasn't wanted. Um, I, I, I find myself going, how can this be? The mimetic answer is there. Those religions have evolved in ways that keep those things um, going for biological reasons. And I, I, mean, I, in my more optimistic moments, I see we are moving away from that. In the UK now, more than half people say they have no religion. Um, that doesn't mean they're all atheists, but they have no religious affiliation um, and, and and then I'm very optimistic and then I watch what's happening in the Islamic world and what's happening in the United States of America and I sometimes despair and I don't want to end up in that horrible miserable like can anyone say anything more cheerful than get me out of that <laughs> um, I don't know whether it's a more cheerful um, thought but um, I thought it might make sense to end with a quick a quick note on teams, uh, which we haven't touched on at all yet. And uh, like the future of me, the third mm. replicator, what are we to expect? But maybe that's, that's more depressing stuff. I don't know. No, it's not depressing. It, it, well, it's kind of frightening, but that's different from depressing. Uh, <laughs> yes, I guess I have to be fairly brief. Um, we did touch on it in a sense when talking about um, internet memes. Um, I, some years ago now, I, I, started wondering whether all the memes that can't because more and more in my life going from as i've described you know with writing letters to 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 email and, and and podcasts and all of this um is this just more memes 
or is there something fundamentally oh it must be six o'clock look what is about to arrive thank you oh lovely <laughs> i expect mine to arrive soon too <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much my love <laughs> it takes away the teacup and brings me the wine I want my um so um i began asking, i'll have a sip if you don't mind oh please do mm. cheers <laughs> and then the awful six o'clock news will be on. It's it's six o'clock in the evening. I'm not, this is not six o'clock morning drinking. Um, <laughs> um, the news will be on and the latest COVID disasters. Mm. Um, so I was asking myself, is this just more memes and they're just kind of in the computer rather than in our heads, or is it something fundamentally different? And the more I thought about it, the more I thought it's something fundamentally different. And in the years since I first had this idea, this is in my 2008 TED lecture and a chapter that started it all off for a, for a book. Um, I decided that it's fundamentally different. I'll explain why I'll try to be, do it briefly, but I thought, well, how did the second replicator appear in the first place? What happened was the phenotypes constructed by the genes, in other words, animals, plants, and human bodies, um, began to copy information in a new way. So there was the only evolutionary process was chemical copying of DNA and RNA and so on. But then came copying of behaviors and making noises and the beginnings of language and all of that. So the, 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 the physical thing that was created by the genes now gave rise to a new kind of copying. So then my question was, well, could that happen again? And it's a very close analogy here. Always be careful of analogies. Mm -hmm. um, it's a close analogy here to say that we humans with our memes constructed computers and phones and servers and all of that stuff for our own benefit, so we thought, but those machines started doing the copying, varying and selecting on their own without us. And I decided, I mean, not exactly arbitrarily, but I mean, I felt I was alone struggling with these ideas. So it's up to me to make a decision. And I decided that if, we could show that in the cloud, which probably didn't exist then, I don't know, but in cyberspace, the machinery that we constructed is doing those three processes without our interference, then there's a new replicator, a third replicator. I first called it teams, and then people started thinking I was talking about football, um, which I absolutely <laughs> wasn't. So I changed it to treams. I think actually it should have been threams to be third replicator, but try treams, I don't know, I hope. <laughs> I wrote an article in New Scientist asking people to suggest names and I got 23 different words and none of them hardly any duplications at all. And so anyway, so at the moment it's dreams. Um, and, and why you're, you're saying that this is depressing, but uh, it's more a bit scary rather than depressing. I think it's rather exciting, but important. If I'm right about this and it is a third replicator, then it's a selfish replicator. All that digital information, all those bloody things that come in and shout at you, you know, and all those adverts saying, buy another one of those, you know, shirt you bought last week. And, you know, <laughs> um, these are evolving and proliferating for, for their own sake, selfishly. And out there, if you think of things like search engines, they are combining their, their copying, varying and selecting information and sending it out. They're going around, there are crawlers going around collecting up stuff. There's a massive amount now, which there wasn't then, of what I would call dreams, the, um, the machinery doing it itself. This becomes a, an argument about the difference between artificial intelligence that is distributed and out there and self-evolving and the kind of artificial intelligence that most people seem to be scared of, which is something that we have created and put into a relatively limited thing, like a robot or a computer or whatever, and you could turn it off potentially, you know? You can't turn off evolved entities if there are evolved entities. I mean, my guess looking at biological processes, evolutionary processes, is that out there in the cloud, there will be entities that collect together, um, that protect themselves because they'll thrive better than bits of dreams that don't get into groups, same way religions do, same way biology things do. And there will be those entities out there competing and they will be partly using our brains to you know, keep going the machinery They'll be using our resources. Um, this is threatening to the planet because if you think about how much fossil fuels are being devoted on this planet to creating all this machinery, it's increasing very fast all the time and just transmitting stuff backwards and forwards. You know, every email we send has a carbon cost. 
And, and if that is proliferating as evolutionary processes do, then we ought to be understanding the problems of AI and what's happening in the world in that way. So to me, it's more a challenge to people to either show that I'm wrong about that and it's just a oh, nice idea, but wrong. Okay, well, just a silly, bad idea. Or to start looking at whether it's really happening, where it's happening, how it's happening, and, 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 and try and answer the question, in a world with three replicators, what is the role of us human beings? And that's a, an interesting and difficult question. I'd rather leave it there than with the depressing thoughts. Yeah, but it's, thoughts it's, about it's a good one. It's a good one to have raised, and it's definitely something that I think we should all, yeah, give some thought to. Uh, so I'm sorry to keep you into your wine time. Um, I'm just going to say thank you ever so much for answering and being so um, so gracious and paying such close attention to what we're all asking. Sometimes we're a bit muddled, but you know, oh, we're kind of in awe great. of you. So, or at least I'll speak for myself. Um, I'll pass it back to Peter. Uh, he has some announcements to make. And, and let me just say, I've really enjoyed the people I can see. It's so <laughs> nice to have, you know, even a small nodding or shaking and some lovely smile from Oz M. Bishop. Um, <laughs> and the others of you, lots more nodding. Thank you very much. I, uh, I've enjoyed talking to you. Thank you so much for coming. So I'll pass it back to Peter. Beautiful. Uh, thanks, Rebecca, for the excellent uh, emceeing. Uh, Susan, for coming uh, to the STOA and getting uh, hit from questions from all, all, all corners. Um, so upcoming events, we got one coming up in less than an hour. Uh, Dave Snowden, uh, naturalizing sense making. He's a sense maker in residence uh, for the month of October, um, or September, I should say. We're in September, not October yet. So that's at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern time. So you can RSVP there. And if you like this event, we got an event next week uh, called Memes virality and the occult with Chris Gabriel and he has this uh, YouTube channel about memes where he analyzes them that's September 28th at 6 p.m. Eastern time you can RSVP there we got tons of events on the website um, stoa.ca if you'd like to support us while we medically steal the culture you can do so on patreon um, that being said again Susan Rebecca everyone thank you for coming to the store today thank you thank you for inviting me and causing me such mental